The Whispering Mummy by Sax Romer. Felix Breton and I were the only occupants of the raised platform at the end of the hall, and the inartistic performance of the bulky dancer who occupied the stage promised to be interminable. From motives of sheer boredom, I studied the details of her dress. A white dress, fitting like a vest from shoulder to hip and having short, full sleeves under which was a sort of blue gauze. Her hair, wrists and ankles glittered with barbaric jewelry and strings of little coins. A deafening orchestra consisting of tambourines, shrieking Arab viols, and the inevitable darabuke surrounded the performer in a half circle, and three other large-sized gawazi mingled their shrill voices with the barbaric discords of the musicians. I yawned. Felix Breton turned to me with a smile, resting his elbows upon the dirty little marble-topped table. He looked sufficiently like an artist to have been merely a painter, yet his gruesome picture, Le Roi S'Amuse, had proved the salvation of the previous salon. Have patience, he said. It is Chezeret et Dour, tree of pearls, that we have come to see, and she has not yet appeared. Unless she appears shortly, I replied, stifling another yawn. I shall disappear. But even as I spoke, there arose a hum of excitement throughout the crowded room. The fat dancer, breathless from her unpleasing exertions, resumed her seat, and all the performers turned their heads towards a door at the side of the stage. A veiled figure entered with slow, lithe step, and her appearance was acclaimed excitedly. Coming to the center of the stage, she threw off her veil with a swift movement and confronted the audience, a slim, barbaric figure. I glanced at Felix Breton. His eyes were glittering with excitement. Here at last was the Gaize of romance, the Gaize of the Egyptian monuments, a true daughter of that mysterious tribe who, in the remote past of the Nile land, wove spells of subtle moon magic before the golden pharaoh. A monstrous crash from the musicians opened the music of the dance, the famous gazelle dance, which commenced to a measure of long, monotonous cadences. Chejeret et Dur began slowly to move her arms and body in that indescribable manner which, like the stirring of palm fronds, speaks the veritable language of the voluptuous Orient. The attendant dancers clashing their miniature cymbals, the measure quickened, and swift passion informed the languorous body, which magically became transformed into that of a leaping nymph, a bacchant, a living illustration of Keats' wonder words. Like to a moving vintage, down they came, crowned with green leaves and faces all aflame, all madly dancing through the pleasant valley to scare thee, melancholy. At the conclusion of her dance, Chejeret Adur, resuming her veil, descended to the floor of the hall and passed from table to table, exchanging light badinage with those patrons known to her. "'Do you think you could induce her to come up here, Kernabi?' said Breton excitedly. "'She is simply the ideal model for my danse funèbre. "'Any inducement other than our presence in this select part of the establishment,' I replied, offering him a cigarette is unnecessary. She will present herself with all reasonable dispatch. Indeed, I had seen the dark eyes glance many times towards us as we sat there in distinguished isolation, and, even as I spoke, the girl was ascending the steps, from whence she approached our table, smiling in friendly fashion. Breton's surprise was rather amusing when she confidently seated herself giving an order to the cross-eyed waiter in close attendance. It would be our privilege, of course, to pay the bill. Of its being a privilege, no one could doubt who had observed the envious glances cast in our direction by less favored patrons. As Breton spoke no Arabic, the task of interpreter devolved upon me, and I was carrying on quite mechanically when my attention was drawn to a 
peculiarly sinister-looking person seated alone at a, close beside the corner of the stage. I remembered having observed him address some remark to Chezeret at Dur, and having noted that she seemed to avoid him. Now he was directing upon us a glare so electrically baleful that when I first detected it I was conscious of a sort of shock. The man was rather oddly dressed, wearing a black turban and a sort of loose robe not unlike the burnous of the desert Arabs. I concluded that he belonged to some religious order, and that his bosom was inflamed with a hatred of a most murderous character towards myself, Felix Breton, and the dancer. I endeavoured, without attracting the girl's notice, to indicate to Breton the presence of the man of the glare, but the artist was so engrossed in contemplation of Chezeret et Dur, and kept me so busy interpreting, that I abandoned the attempt in despair. Having made his wishes evident to her, the girl readily consented to pose for him, and when next I glanced at the table near the stage, the man of the glare had disappeared. What induced me to look towards the rear of the platform upon which we were seated, I know not, unless I did so in obedience to a species of hypnotic suggestion. But something prompted me to glance over my shoulder, and, for the second time that night, I encountered the gaze of mysterious eyes. From a little square window, these compelling eyes regarded me fixedly, and presently I distinguished the outline of a head surmounted by a white turban. The second watcher was Abu Taba. What business could have brought the mysterious Imam to such a place was a problem beyond my powers of conjecture. But that he was silently directing me to depart with all speed I presently made out. Having signified by a gesture that I had grasped the purport of his message, I turned again to Breton who was struggling to carry on a conversation with Chegeret et Dur in his native French. I experienced some difficulty in inducing him to leave, but my arguments finally prevailed, and we passed out into the dimly lighted street. About us, in the darkness, pipes wailed, and there was the dim throbbing of the eternal Darabuke. We were in that part of El Wasser adjoining the notorious square of the fountain Discordant woman voices filled the night, and strange figures flitted from the shadows into the light, streaming from the open doorways. It was the center of secret Cairo, the midnight city, and three paces from the door of the dance hall, a slim, black-robed figure suddenly appeared at my elbow, and the musical voice of Abu Taba spoke close to my ear. Be on the terrace of shepherds in half an hour. The mysterious figure melted again into the shadows about us. On the deserted hotel balcony, Abu Taba awaited me. It was indeed fortunate, Kurnabi Pasha, he said, that I observed you this evening. I am greatly obliged to you, I replied, for watching over me with such paternal solicitude. May I inquire what danger I have incurred? I was angrily conscious of feeling like a schoolboy suffering reproof. A very great danger, Abu Taba assured me, his gentle, musical voice expressing real concern. Ahmad Eskebir is the lover of the dancer called Shejeret ed Dur, although she who is of the Gawasi of Kench does not return his affections. Ahmad Eskebir? Do you refer to a malignant looking person in a black turban? I inquired. Abu Taba gravely inclined his head. He is one of the Rifa'iye, the black Darwishes. They practice strange rites, and are by some accredited with supernatural powers. For you, the danger is not so great as for your friend, who seem to be speaking words of love to the Gaize. I laughed shortly. You are mistaken, Abu Taba, I replied. His interest was not of the character you suppose. He is an artist, and merely desired the girl to pose for him. Abu Taba shrugged his shoulders. She is an unveiled woman, he said contemptuously, but love in the heart of one such as Ahmad is a terrible passion, consuming the vitals and rendering whom it afflicts either a partaker of paradise 
or as one of the evil jinn. In the particular case under consideration, I said, it would seem distinctly to have produced the latter and less agreeable symptoms. Let your friend step warily, advised Abu Taba, for some who have aroused the enmity of the black darwishes have met with strange ends, nor has it been possible to fix responsibility upon any member of the order. You think my poor friend Felix Breton may be discovered some morning in an unpleasantly messy condition? The black darwishes do not employ the knife, answered Abu Taba. They employ strange and more subtle weapons. I stared hard at him in the darkness. I thought I knew my Cairo, but this sounded unpleasantly mysterious. However, I am indebted to you, Abu Taba, I said, for your timely warning. As you know, I always personally avoid any possibility of misunderstanding in regard to my relations with Egyptian womenfolk. With some rare exceptions, agreed Abu Taba, particulars of which escape my memory at the moment, you have always been a model of discretion, Kurnabi Pasha. I will warn my friend, I said hastily, of the view of his conduct mistakenly taken by the gentleman in the black turban. It is well, replied Abu Taba. We shall meet again ere long. With that, and the customary dignified salutations, he departed, leaving me wondering what hidden significance lay in his words. We shall meet again ere long. Experience had taught me that Abu Taba's warnings were not to be lightly dismissed, and I knew enough of the fanaticism of those strange eastern sects, whereof the Rifaie, or Black Darwishes, was one to realize that it would prove an unhealthy amusement to interfere with their domestic affairs. Felix Breton, who possessed the rare gift of capturing and transferring to canvas the atmosphere of the East, with the opulent colorings and vivid contrasts which constitute its charm, had nevertheless but little practical experience of the manners and customs of the Golden Orient. He had leased a large studio, situated on the roof of a fine old Kyrene palace, hidden away behind the street of the booksellers, and almost in the shadow of the mosque of El Hazar. His romantic spirit had prompted him, after a time, to give up his rooms at the Continental and to take up his abode in the apartment adjoining the studio, that is to say, completely to cut himself off from European life and to become an inhabitant of the Oriental city. With his imperfect knowledge of the practical side of native life in the East, I did not envy him, but I was fully alive to his danger. Isolated as he was from the European community, indeed from modernity, for out of the boulevards of modern Cairo into the streets of the Arabian Nights is but a step, yet a step that bridges the gulf of centuries. As I entered his studio on the following morning, I discovered him at work upon the extraordinary picture Danse Funèbre. Chegeret et Dour was posing in the dress of an ancient priestess of Isis. Breton briefly greeted me, waving his hand towards a cushioned diwan before which stood a little coffee table bearing decanters, siphons, cigarettes, and other companionable paraphernalia. Making myself comfortable, I studied the picture and the model. Danse Funèbre was an extraordinary conception, representing an elaborately furnished modern room, apparently that of an antiquary or Egyptologist, for a multitude of queer relics decorated the walls, cabinets, and the large table at which a man was seated. Boldly represented, immediately to the left of his chair stood a mummy in an ornate sarcophagus, and forth from the swathed figure into the light cast downwards from an antique lamp floated a beautiful spirit shape, that of an Egyptian priestess. Upon her face was an expression of intense anger, as, her fingers crooked in sinister fashion, she bent over the man at the table. The mummy and sarcophagus depicted on the canvas stood before me against the wall of the studio, the lid resting beside the case. 
It was molded, as is sometimes seen, to represent the face and figure of the occupant, and was as fine an example of the kind as I had met with. The mummy was that of a priestess and dancer of the great temple at Philae, and it had been lent by the museum authorities for the purpose of Breton's picture. His enthusiasm at first seeing Scheheret et Dur was explainable by the really uncanny resemblance which the girl bore to the modelled figure. Studying her from my seat on the diwan, as she posed in that gauzy raiment depicted upon the lid of the sarcophagus, it seemed indeed that the ancient priestess was reborn in the form of Shejeret et Dur, the Gaize. Breton had evidently tabooed makeup, with the exception of the characteristic black bordering to the eyes, which appeared in the presentiment of the servant of Isis, and seen now in its natural coloring, the face of the dancing girl had undoubted beauty. Presently, whilst the model rested, I informed Breton of my conversation with Abu Taba, but, as I had anticipated, he was skeptical to the point of derision. "'My dear Kanabi, he said, is it likely that I am going to interrupt my work now that I have found such an inspiring model because some ridiculous Darwish disapproves? It is highly unlikely, I admitted, but do not make the mistake of treating the matter lightly. You are right off the map here, and Cairo is not Paris. It is a great deal safer, he cried in his boisterous fashion, and infinitely more interesting but my mind was far from easy, for in the dark eyes of the model, when their glance rested upon Félix Breton, there was that to have aroused poisonous sentiments in the bosom of the man of the glare. During the course of the following month I saw Félix Breton two or three times, and he was enthusiastic about the progress of his picture and the beauty of his model, the first hint that I received of the strange idea, which was to lead to stranger happenings, came one afternoon when he had called upon me at Shepherd's. "'Do you believe in reincarnation, Kernabi? he asked suddenly. I stared at him in surprise. "'Regardless of my personal views on the matter,' I replied, "'in what way does the subject interest you?' Momentarily he hesitated. Then, the resemblance between Yasmina, this was the real name of Shejeret ed Dur, and the priestess of Isis, he said, appears to me too marked to be explainable by mere coincidence. If the mummy were my personal property, I should unwrap it. Do you seriously desire me to believe that you regard Yasmina as a reincarnation of the elder lady? That or a lineal descendant, he answered. The tribe of the Gawasi is of unknown antiquity and may very well be descended from those temple dancers of the days of the pharaohs. If you have studied the ancient wall paintings, you cannot have failed to observe that the dancing girls represented have entirely different forms from those of any other women depicted and from those of the ordinary Egyptian women of today. His enthusiasm was tremendous. He was one of those uncomfortable fanatics who will ride a theory to the death. I cannot say that I have noticed it, I replied. Your knowledge of the female form divine is doubtless more extensive than mine. My dear Kernabi, he cried excitedly, to the trained eye the difference is extraordinary. Until I saw Yasmina, I had believed the peculiar form to which I refer to be extinct, like the blue enamel in the sacred lotus. If it is not reincarnation, it is heredity. I could not help thinking that it more closely resembled insanity than either, but since Breton had made no reference to the wearer of the black turban, I experienced less anxiety respecting his physical than his mental welfare. Three days later, there was a dramatic development. Drifting idly into Breton's studio one morning, I found him pacing the place in despair, 
and glaring at his unfinished canvas like a man distraught. Where is Chezeret Adur? I inquired. Gone, he replied. She disappeared yesterday, and I can find no trace of her. Surely the excellent Suleiman, proprietor of the dancing establishment, can assist you. I tell you, cried Breton savagely, that she has disappeared. No one knows what has become of her. I looked at him in dismay. He presented a mournful spectacle. He was unshaven, and his dark hair was wildly disordered. His despair was more acute than I should have supposed possible in the circumstances, and I concluded that his interest in Yasmina was deeper than I had assumed, or that I was incapable of comprehending the artistic temperament. I suppose the Gallic blood in him had something to do with it, but I was unspeakably distressed to observe that the man was on the verge of tears. Consolation was impossible, and I left him pacing his empty studio distractedly. That night, at an unearthly hour, long after I had retired to my own apartments, he came to Shepherd's. Being shown into my room, and the servant having departed, "'Yasmina is dead!' he burst out, standing there, a disheveled figure, just within the doorway. "'What?' I exclaimed, standing up from the table at which I had been writing and confronting him. "'Dead? Do you mean?' "'He has murdered her,' said Breton in a dull, monotonous voice. "'That fiend of whom you warned me!' I was appalled, for I had been utterly unprepared for such a tragedy. "'Who discovered her?' "'No one discovered her. She will never be discovered. He has buried her body in some secret spot in the desert.' My amazement grew with every word that he uttered, and presently, "'Then how in heaven's name did you learn of her murder?' I asked. Félix Breton, who had begun to pace up and down the room, a truly pitiable figure, paused and looked at me wildly. "'You will think that I am mad, Kernabi,' he said. "'But I must tell you. I must tell someone.' I could see that you were incredulous when I spoke to you of reincarnation, but I was right, Kernabi, I was right. Either that or my reason is deserting me. My opinion inclined distinctly in the direction of the latter theory, but I remained silent, watching Breton's haggard face. Tonight, he continued, as I sat looking at my unfinished picture and trying to imagine what could have become of Yasmina, the mummy of the priestess, spoke to me. I slowly sank back into my chair. I was now assured that Félix Breton had formed a sudden and intense infatuation for Yasmina, and that her mysterious disappearance had deranged his sensitive mind. Words failed me. I could think of nothing to say, and bending towards me his haggard face, it whispered to me he said, in her voice, in my own language, French, as I have taught it to her, just a few imperfect words, but sufficient to convey to me the story of the tragedy. Kernabi, what does it mean? Is it possible that her spirit, released from the body of Yasmina, has returned to that which I firmly believe it formerly inhabited? I had had the misfortune to be a party to some distressing scenes, but few had affected me so unpleasantly as this. That poor Félix Breton was raving, I could not doubt, but having persuaded him to spend the night at Shepherd's, and having seen him safely to bed, I returned to my own room to endeavour to work out the problem of what steps I should take regarding him on the morrow. In the morning, however, he seemed more composed having shaved and generally rendered himself more presentable. But the wild look still lingered in his eyes, and I could see that the strange obsession had secured a firm hold upon him. He discussed the matter quite calmly during breakfast, and invited me to visit the scene of this supernatural happening. I assented, and hailing Arabia, we drove together to the studio.
There was nothing abnormal in the appearance of the place, but I examined the mummy and the mummy case with a new curiosity, for if Félix Breton was not mad, and this was a point upon which I recognized my incompetence to decide, the phantom voice was clearly the product of some trick. However, I was unable to discover anything to account for it. The sarcophagus stood against the outer wall of the studio and near to a large lattice window before which was draped a heavy tapestry curtain for the purpose of excluding undesirable light upon that side of the model's throne. There was no balcony outside the window, which was fully 30 feet from the street below. Therefore, unless someone had been hiding in the window recess beside the sarcophagus, trickery appeared to be out of the question. Turning to Breton, who was watching me haggardly, "'You searched the recess last night?' I said. "'I did. Immediately. There was no one there. There was no one anywhere in the studio, and when I looked out of the open window, the street below was deserted from end to end.' Naturally, I took it for granted that he would avoid the place, at any rate, by night, and I said as much as we passed along the Mousquet together. I can never forget the wildness in his eyes as he turned to me. I must go back, Kernabi, he said. It seems like desertion, base and cowardly. Breton did not join me at dinner that evening, as we had arranged that he should do, and towards the hour of ten o'clock, growing more and more uneasy on his behalf, I set out for the studio, half hoping that I should meet him. I saw nothing of him, however. As I crossed the Esbequie Gardens and the Atabat el Cadra into the Muski, from thence onward to the Rond Point, the dark and narrow streets were almost deserted, and from the corner of the Sharia el Cordaguia to the street of the bookbinders, I met with no living thing, save a lean and furtive cat. My footsteps echoed hollowly from wall to wall of the overhanging buildings, as I approached the door giving access to the courtyard from which a stair communicated with the studio above. The moonlight, slanting down into the ancient place, left more than half of it in densest shadow, but just touched the railing of the balcony and the lower part of the Mushrabie screen masking what once had been the harem apartments from the view of one entering the courtyard. Far above me, through an open lattice, a dim light shone out, though vaguely. This part of the house was bathed in the radiance of the moon, which dimmed that of the studio lamp, for the open window was the window of Breton's studio. The door at the foot of the stairs was partly open, and I ascended slowly, since the place was quite dark, and I was forced to feel my way around the eccentric turnings introduced by an Arab architect, to whom simplicity had evidently been an abomination. A modern door had been fitted to the studio, and although this door was also unfastened, I rapped loudly. But, receiving no answer, entered the studio. It was empty. The lamp was lighted as I had observed from below, and a faint aroma of Turkish tobacco smoke hung in the air. Clearly, Breton had left but a few moments earlier, and I judged it probable that he would be returning very shortly. For had he set out for Shepherds, he would not have left his door unlocked, and in any event I should have met him on the way. Therefore, having glanced into the inner room, which, latterly, Breton had been using as a bedroom, I sat down on the diwan and prepared to await his return. The lamp whose light I had seen shining through the window was that which hung before the model's throne, and the curtain which usually draped the window recess had been partially pulled aside, so that from where I sat I could see part of the center lattice, which was open. My mind at this time was entirely occupied with uneasy speculations regarding Breton, and although I had glanced more than once at the large, unfinished picture on the easel from which the face of Shejeret ed dur peered out across the shoulder of the seated man, and several times had looked at the mummy set upright in its painted sarcophagus, no sense of the uncanny had touched me or in any way prepared me for the amazing manifestation which I was about to witness. 
How long I sat there? I could not say exactly, possibly for ten minutes or a quarter of an hour, when, suddenly, an eerie whisper crept through the stillness of the big room. Since I had more than once been temporarily tricked into belief in the supernatural by means of certain ingenious devices, I did not readily fall a victim to the mysterious nature of the present occurrence. Yet I must confess that my heart gave a great leap, and I was forced to exert all my will to control my nerves. I sat quite still, listening intently for a repetition of that evil whisper. Then, in the stillness, it came again. Felix, it breathed, because of you, I lie dead in a grave in the desert. I died for you, Felix, and now I am so lonely. The whispering voice offered no clue to the age or sex of the speaker, for a true whisper is toneless, but the words, as Breton had declared, were uttered in broken French and spoken with a curious accent. It ceased, that ghostly whispering, and I realized that my nerves could stand no more of it, for that it came or seemed to come from the mummy of the priestess was a fact as undeniable as it was horrible. Resorting to action, I sprang up and leapt across the room, grasping first at the curtain draped in the window on the right of the sarcophagus. I jerked it fully aside. The recess was empty. All three lattices were open, on the right, left, and in the center of the window. But craning out from the ladder, I saw the street below to be vacant from end to end. Stepping back into the room, and metaphorically clutching my courage with both hands, I approached the sarcophagus, peered behind it, all around it, and, finally, into the swathed face of the mummy itself. Nothing rewarded my search, but the studio of Félix Breton seemed to have become icily cold. At any rate, I found myself to be shivering and walking deliberately, although it cost me a monstrous effort to do so. I descended the dark, winding stairway into the courtyard, and, on regaining the street, discovered to my intense annoyance that my brow was wet with cold perspiration. I had taken no more than ten paces in the direction of the Souk et Soudan when I heard the sound of approaching footsteps, and for some reason, I can only suppose as a result of my highly strung condition, I stepped into the shelter of a narrow gateway where I could see without being seen, and there awaited the appearance of the one who approached. It was Félix Berton, his face showing ghastly in the moonlight as he turned the corner. I could not be certain if a mere echo had deceived me, but I thought I could detect faintly the softer footfalls of someone who was following him. From my cover, I had an uninterrupted view of the entrance to the house which I had just left, and without showing myself, I watched Breton approach the door. At its threshold, he seemed to hesitate, and in that brief hesitancy were illustrated the conflicting emotions driving the man. I recalled the words he had spoken to me that morning. I must go back, Kernabi. It seems like desertion, base and cowardly. He opened the door and disappeared. As he did so, a second figure crossed from the shadows on the opposite side of the street, that is, the side upon which I was concealed, and in turn advanced towards the door. As he passed my hiding place I acted. Without an instant's hesitation I hurled myself upon him. How he avoided that furious attack, if he did avoid it, or whether in the darkness I miscalculated my spring, I do not know to this day. I only know that I missed my objective, stumbled, recovered myself, and turned with clenched fists to find Abu Taba confronting me. Kernabi Pasha, he cried. Abu Taba? I said dazedly. I perceive that I am not alone in my anxiety for the welfare of Monsieur Félix Breton. But why were you following him? I narrowly missed assaulting you. Very narrowly he agreed in his gentle manner. But you asked me why I was following Monsieur Breton. I was following him because I have seen so many of those who have crossed the path of the black darwishes 
meet with violent and inexplicable deaths. Murder? I whispered. Not murder. Suicide. Therefore, observing as I had anticipated a strangeness in your friend's behavior, I have watched him. The strangeness of his behavior is easily accounted for, I said, and excitedly, for the horror of the episode in the studio was still strongly upon me, I told him of the whispering mummy. These are very dreadful things of which you speak, Kernabi Pasha, he admitted, but I warned you that it was ill to incur the enmity of the black Darwishes. That there is a scheme afoot to encompass the self-destruction or insanity of your friend is now evident to me, and he has brought this calamity upon himself, for the words which he believed to be spoken by the spirit of the girl Yasmina would not have affected him so unpleasantly if his attitude toward her had been marked by proper restraint and the affair confined within suitable limitations. Quite so. But although the black Darwishes may be both malignant and clever, that uncanny whispering is beyond the control of natural forces. Such is not my opinion, replied Abu Tawa. A spirit does not mistake one person for another, and the whispering voice addressed itself to Felix, when Felix was not present. I believe, Kernabi Pasha, that you are the possessor of a pair of excellent opera glasses. May I suggest that you return to Shepherd's and procure them? The platform of the minaret seemed very cold to the touch of my stockinged feet, for I had left my shoes at the entrance to the mosque below, in accordance with custom, and now, from the wooden balcony, I overlooked the neighboring roofs of Cairo, and Abu Taba, beside me, pointed to where a vague patch of light broke the darkness beneath us to the left. The window of Monsieur Félix Breton's studio, he said. Raising the glasses to his eyes, he gazed in that direction, whilst I also peered thither and succeeded in making out the well of the courtyard and the roofs of the buildings to the right and left of it. It was not evident to me for what Abu Taba was looking, and when presently he lowered the glasses and turned to me, I expressed my doubts in words. It is surely evident, I said, speaking, as I now almost invariably did to the imam in English, of which he had a perfect mastery, that we have little chance of discovering anything from here, since nothing was visible from the studio window. Furthermore, who, save Yasmina, could have spoken in the manner which I have related and in broken French? An eavesdropper, he replied, might have profited by the lessons which Yasmina received from Monsieur Breton, and all vocal characteristics are lost in a whisper. In the second place, Yasmina is not dead. What? I cried. Although, when Breton had informed me of her death, I myself had doubted him. For some reason, the ghostly whisper had convinced me as it had convinced him. She has been kept a prisoner during the past week in a house belonging to one of the black Darwishes, continued Abu Taba. But my agents succeeded in tracing her this morning. By my orders, however, she has not been allowed to return to her home. And what was the object of those orders? That I might learn for what purpose she had been made to disappear, replied Abu Taba, and I have learned it tonight. Then you think that the whispering mummy? He suddenly clutched my arm. Quick, raise your glasses, he said softly. On the roof of the house to the left of the light, there is the whispering mummy. Strung up to a high pitch of excitement, I gazed through the glasses in the direction indicated by my companion. Without difficulty I discerned him, a man wearing a black turban, who crept like some ungainly cat along the flat roof, carrying in his hand what looked like one of those sugar canes, which pass for a delicacy among the natives, but which to European eyes appear more suitable for curtain poles than sweetmeats. Springing perilously across a yawning gulf, the wearer of the black turban gained the roof of the studio, crept along for some little distance further, and then, lying prone, began slowly to lower the bamboo rod in the direction of the lighted window. 
I found that unconsciously I had suspended my respiration, and now, breathlessly, as the truth came home to me, it is a speaking tube, I cried. I cannot see the end of it, but no doubt it is curved so as to protrude through the side of the lattice window. Do you look, Abu Taba? I propose to act. Thrusting the glasses into the imam's hand, I took my Colt repeater from my pocket and, having peered for some seconds steadily in the direction of the dimly visible Darwish, I opened fire. I had fired five shots in the heat of my anger at that sinister, crouching figure, ere Abu Taba seized my wrist. Stop! he cried. Do you forget where you stand? Truly, I had forgotten in my indignation, or I should not have outraged his feelings by firing from the minaret of a mosque. But sufficient of my wrath remained to occasion me a thrill of satisfaction, when peering through the dusk I saw the Darwish throw up his arms and disappear from view. There is blood in the courtyard, said Abu Taba, but Ahmad es Kabir has fled. Therefore he still lives, and his anger will be not the less but the greater. Depart from Cairo, Monsieur Breton. It is my counsel to you. But, cried Felix Breton, glaring wildly at the big canvas on the easel, I must finish my picture. As Yasmina is alive, she must return, and I must finish my picture. Yasmina cannot return, replied Abu Taba, fixing his weird eyes upon the speaker. I have caused her to be banished from Cairo. He raised his hand, checking Breton's hot words ere they were uttered. Recriminations are unavailing. Her presence disturbs the peace of the city. And the peace of the city it is my duty to maintain. <laughs>